Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our Beasley Allen webinar presentation on the approaching deadlines in the Camp Lejeune litigation. Just to set the stage, we've got less than four months remaining for Marines, family members, and civilians who were harmed by contaminated water at the Camp Lejeune military base to file their administrative claim for compensation under the Camp Lejeune Justice Act. Now, this process to submit a claim by the August deadline is very detailed. It requires a substantial documentation, uh, lots of paperwork for support. Here at Beasley Island, we've got a really great team of lawyers handling these claims on behalf of those affected to ensure that all of the claims are submitted properly, that they're done thoroughly, and they get in on time. Now, the head of our team, Ron Jones, serves on the Camp Lejeune Plaintiff's Executive Committee and the Resolution Committee, where he and other members are working to develop reasonable settlement solutions for all of the impacted Camp Lejeune victims. That helps ensure that they're properly compensated for their injuries, and that's that's really the goal of the steering committee. Today, I'm delighted to introduce four very important members of Beasley Allen's Camp Lejeune team. Uh, Ron Jones, Marion Brummel, Wesley Merrillot, and Travis Chen. Together, Ron, Marion, Wesley, and Travis are gonna discuss all aspects of the Camp Lejeune claim process, and they're gonna update you on the progress of the Camp Lejeune litigation as a whole. Last but not least, they're gonna take your questions at the end of their presentation as well. So before I turn the program over to our four speakers, and while we're waiting on the last of our registrants to join us, let's go over a few quick CLE housekeeping notes. First, today's webinar has been approved by the Alabama and Georgia State Bars for one hour of CLE credit. In order to receive full credit for attending, you must stay on for the duration of the program. A link to today's program was included in the Zoom confirmation email you should have received when you registered. But by the end of this week, you'll receive another email with a certificate of attendance and an updated presentation and video link. You can email that completed evaluation form to webinars at BeasleyAllen.com. This webinar is being recorded. And for those Alabama and Georgia attorneys participating by phone, please email us your name, phone number, and state bar ID number to webinars at BeasleyAllen.com. That'll help us ensure that you receive full CLE credit. For those of you practicing in other states besides Alabama and Georgia, we'll send you a certificate of attendance that you can present to your own state bar. Also, be sure to check out the events page of our website, beasleyallen.com slash events, as we'll be adding more webinars throughout 2024. Finally, if you have questions during today's webinar, I wanna encourage you to use the question and answer feature located at the bottom of your screen. Look down at the bottom of your screen, you'll see the Q&A feature right there. We're going to set aside time at the end of today's program to try to tackle all of your questions. So with that, I'm going to turn the program over now to Ron and his wonderful team. Thank you, David. Um, and also, thank you, everybody, for being on today. Uh, I know that you're busy. Your work is busy. Your life is busy. So we appreciate you taking the time to join us. Hopefully, this will be a productive hour as you uh, either learn or see things that will help you uh, with your clients uh, in this process. This is a this is a fun case in the sense that it is a, a real honor to try to help all the people that, that we and you all are trying to help. But it's also a very challenging case. Uh, there's lots of moving parts here. There's many things that are going on. It seems to be evolving and changing as we work towards August. So the, the goal today will be to, to give you some background, some of which you may already have, hopefully not much, but then we're going to move into, you know, the, the, the claims process, what we're doing, how things are going there. Uh, Marion, Travis, Wesley, they are in the trenches every day. Uh, they are doing such a wonderful job for our firm with these clients. They're very knowledgeable about all aspects of the case. So uh, with that, I'll turn it over to them and let them let them get started with their presentations. All right. Thanks, Ron, for that introduction. Um, again, my name is Travis Chin. I'm one of the attorneys um, on the team for helping uh, our service members, families, and civilians at camp with these Camp Lejeune claims. 
Um, I want to first start off with just a brief purpose and the history of uh, these of the Camp Lejeune claims and this presentation. Um, today's purpose, hopefully, is to not only bring about where awareness of what happened at Camp Lejeune, the Camp Lejeune's claims as well, but also uh, break down a barrier for any uh, lawyers who might not have a good understanding of Camp Lejeune or individuals who are afraid to ask um, because I've come across many clients who are just, they don't know uh, that they can file a claim on themselves or for a family member. And so that's what we're here for. And that's what we're um, trying to try to clear up today. And so just, just a brief overview of the history of Camp Lejeune and contamination. In September 1942, Camp Lejeune uh, was uh, the uh, military base opened up. And about a decade later, uh, for the next three decades after, uh, from August 1953 to nine, uh, December 1987, um, Marines, their families, and everybody in between drank, bathed, and did normal stuff that we would normally um, do with water. Uh, but that water itself was contaminated with uh, harmful chemicals, toxic, that at, at, at some points during testing were 3,400 times what OSHA's permissible exposure limits were. Um, in 1974, there was a base order that required the safe disposal of solvents that were being used on base. Um, and it warned that um, improper handling could lead to uh, drinking water contamination. Yet the solvents that were supposed to be uh, pro uh, properly handled were dumped or buried near the wells uh, for years on, on base. And they just leached into the water system. Uh, eventually, in, in the 80s, these volatile organic compounds were eventually found in the Camp Lejeune water system. And then years later, did it finally become public? Um, now, the, there are many different sources of the contamination. There's uh, possibilities from the solvents that are being used from a off-base dry cleaning company to uh, on-base units using chemicals to clean military equipment, just the, similar to how we use brake cleaner uh, to clean some uh, uh, car parts um and so and and also from the just the general storage of these chemicals in underground storage tanks that would leach from uh from just old equipment and so the, the health risks that associate are associated with uh, these chemicals and mr uh will be explaining a little bit more later on but they can lead to many various birth defects, miscarriages, illnesses, cancers, and everything in between. And, and um, it, it is a fight that we're, we're fighting every day on for our clients on these injuries that they suffered. And so um, now with the Camp Lejeune Act itself that, and uh, this is just a picture of the uh, water systems that were affected and the service areas. Um, we can see it covers a majority of uh, all the residential areas at Camp Lejeune, from the Naval Hospital to Tawara Terrence, which is a, su a suburban community, to Haddon Point and Camp Johnson. Um, and so the Camp Lejeune Act itself is a small part of the 22 uh, PACT Act, honoring our PACT Act. That was signed by President Joe Biden in August on August 10th, uh, 2022. And it is a small subsection of the PACT Act, specifically uh, Section 804. And we'll be providing a copy of this presentation to everybody who's attended. But uh, and so if you want to read the entire bill in its entirety, uh, we have included a link as well. Um, but with the specifics of the PACT Act and the highlights, is from the date it was enacted and signed into law, there's a two year uh, window uh, for claimants, their family members or civilians to file these acts, uh, to file these claims. And that deadline is gonna be in, on, in four months on August 10th, 2024, 115 days from now. Now the uh, act itself um, pretty much in uh, waves, the statute of limitations that North Carolina statutes are posed that were previously 
preventing uh, Camp Lejeune uh, lawsuits from being filed or were being dismissed because of that. Now, uh, in there, it establishes the a certain burden of proof, which is a causal relationship is at least likely as not. And um, later on, we'll be explaining what that means in more uh, greater de detail by one of uh, uh, Mr. Brummel. But the big thing it establishes two um, two sp two basic requirements. Um, it's, it has to be covered. You had to have been exposed between the periods from August 1953 to December 1987, and that, that you had to you have to be able to show uh, an injury stemming from that. And now with the exposure, um, I'll be passing it on to Mr. Wesley Merrillett, uh, who will go more into depth with that. Thanks, Travis, and, and good morning, good afternoon, I guess, to some of you, depending on your time zone. Um, it's Again, it's a pleasure to be able to be here today and um, just share some information that we're kind of seeing, like Ron said, from the trenches, um, hopefully to help you guys out there, uh, just with the claims that you still have on hand um, as you're moving those forward. Um, as Travis uh, uh, just alluded to, there's really two basic requirements we're looking at here uh, under this act. Was somebody exposed and were they injured because of that uh, exposure? The um, exposure to the contaminated water, like, like again, like Travis mentioned, um, had to have occurred between August 1st, 1953 through December 31st, 1987 had to have been for at least 30 days. Those 30 days didn't have to be, do not have to be consecutive. Um, you know, some, you'll find some service members may have had a, been stationed at Camp Lejeune for a, a four week training period. Then they might've left and they might've um, been reassigned to Camp Lejeune for another period. So in totality, we need 30 days or more and um, how do you prove it? And it, that's that's a challenge. Um, and it's an odd challenge because the government, for most of these individuals, has those records. They know who was at Camp Lejeune and who was not. Uh, but they place that initial kind of burden of, uh, of proof on us to show that exposure. So uh, it depends on what kind of claimant you have, you're looking at. Obviously, uh, there are military claimants, uh, veterans who served, worked, were stationed at Camp Lejeune. You have their dependents, spouse, children, uh, even um, children who were in utero at the time. Um, their mother was exposed to the contaminated water at Camp Lejeune. And then you have this category of civilians, uh, workers, individuals, friends who may have been visiting here or there. Um, that uh, you know you have to try to establish or verify that exposure. Um, again, the starting with the military, uh, the veterans and their families, the documentation that we look for uh, to prove that is I, most um, ideally their service records or their personnel file. You can get a DD-214, it will show that they served in a particular branch, it will show um, how long they served. It often doesn't show their duty stations, it doesn't sh often show how long they were there, but it is proof of service. Their service records will often contain more detail as to when they were transferred, when they were assigned to Camp Lejeune, um, how long they were there. Um, maybe even where they were living, you know, what what uh, part of Camp Lejeune they were at. So that's really the ideal uh, record that we look for. To obtain that record, um, you can use standard form 180. And that, that is a uh, form that's available online. And we have that up there for you, the link. You can send that out if, you, if you're not familiar with it. Um, I will tell you that this is... Uh, you know, even in my experience, the it's real critical to make sure that that form is filled out correctly. You're just taking that moment to kind of read those directions, making sure every line is filled out properly, that it's properly submitted. 
Um, the National Personnel Record Center has reported getting 4,000, 5,000 rec record requests a day. Some of these, they are manually getting this request. They have to verify the authenticity of the, the, the individual making the request. They literally go out to a warehouse, pull some of these records, come in, redact third-party information in them, reproduce, copy them, put cover letters together and send them out. So anything that's inaccurate, that's incomplete in that um, request can really delay um, you know, them, them gathering those records. So the we are experiencing, sometimes we get those back in, you know, in a couple weeks, sometimes we've seen it take a couple months. The in situations uh, where the veteran has deceased, um, that request can be made by next of kin. And so the military and those the, the guidelines govern that are very specific. It has to be next of kin is defined as an unmarried, a surviving spouse an, um, who is unmarried. So if the surviving spouse remarried, they are not considered next of kin. Uh, parents can be next of kin. Children can be next of kin. Siblings under the statute can be next of kin. So those individuals um, are able to pursue and uh, uh, submit an SF-180 and, and get those records. Um, there will be some document, additional documentation that's needed, proof of death, death certificates, obituaries, those types of things um, that need to be submitted as well. But that can all be submitted online at the EVET RECs. Um, I will share there is one kind of caveat to this, to getting these military records. Just be mindful of the years of service you're looking for. So if you're looking for something prior to 1962, the National Personal, Personnel Records Center does not have. Uh, they transfer everything over to the archives, and that record, those records become public record, uh, and you can obtain them even through a FOIA request. But you don't want to submit an SF-180, um, do all that work, wait, and then receive a letter that says we don't have that information and then have to start over and submit it to the National Archives. So uh, that's basically the issue um, or how you go about getting the military records. We do ask, I personally ask uh, any client I'm talking to, a new client, do you have any military records on hand? Um, sometimes they do, and it can help us expedite uh, developing that claim. And you know, if they don't, we just go through those steps and, and gather that information. The, uh, for civilians, it's a different kind of animal. There is no uh, military record that we're going to be able to pull if, if they weren't there as a civilian dependent. So if they were there for work purposes, that is something that we are often are looking at and we're trying to say, do you have any employment records? You know, do you have any, um, um, access badges you kept as a souvenir, anything that might kind of show your connection there. Uh, but ultimately, it may come down to, to us developing an affidavit of exposure. And uh, that affidavit will just kind of say, look, you know, this is where I worked. This is how long I worked here. This was how frequently uh, my exposure was to Camp Lejeune. And it will... Um, uh, should ideally say, I, I don't have any access to any other records. Here's the efforts I made. I will tell you that EO, that second, it's considered secondary evidence. So for EO purposes, it's not sufficient. Um, in the public guidance, they, they specifically note that that affidavit will not be specific. So that's kind of just that overview of exposure. Marion is going to um, now kind of talk about the, the injury component of it. And, um, and then we can kind of revisit any questions at the end about exposure. All right, thank you, Wes. So my name is Marion Brummel and I will be addressing the injury side of the litigation, some of the more recent updates and go over some of the common issues we encountered. So first I'll, I'll briefly delve into some of the research supporting a link between certain illnesses and their relationship to exposure to those chemicals at Camp Lejeune. So the 2017 ATSDR report 
evaluated the increased risk of certain health effects for civilians and military personnel potentially exposed to volatile organic compounds or VOCs while working and or residing at Camp Lejeune. The contaminants identified in the study include TCE, PCE, benzene, DCE, and vinyl chloride. A number of cancers and other health conditions were evaluated, and significantly, the study found an increased risk of certain cancers among those exposed at Camp Lejeune as compared to similarly situated personnel at Camp Pendleton. Now, under the CLJA, uh, it requires an equipoise and above burden of proof, where equipoise is defined as evidence that is sufficient to conclude that a positive association is at least as likely as not, but not sufficient to conclude that a positive association exists. Rather than a preponderance of the evidence benchmark, this represents a nebulous 50% standard. Similarly, sufficient is defined as evidence that is sufficient to conclude that a positive association exists. I, I won't belabor the arguments about whether general causation will suffi suffice under the act, but I, I do think it's worthwhile to note that the 2017 ATSDR report is not necessarily the end all be all for, for all potentially compensable injuries. So epidemiological experts are reviewing and compiling research with evidence linking the chemicals at Camp Lejeune to other injuries, not necessarily evaluated in the report. The court, for example, is requesting that the plaintiffs and government brief the injury category of neurobehavioral effects, which the VA has described, um, including symptoms ranging from visual impairment and hearing loss to seizures, muscle weakness, and judgment and memory impairment. So I, I will say that, you know, the injuries listed here and, and also on the, you know, elective option, short form complaint, et cetera, Although those, the, although those injuries do have a lot of evidence, I, I don't think that they are necessarily, that's an exhaustive list. So regardless of what in specific injuries are ultimately found compensable, the CLJA does restrict recovery to injuries that accrued before August 10th, 2022, the date of enactment of the law. Notwithstanding, there's a strong argument to be made that this deadline could include uh, later diagnosed injuries if treatment began before August 10th, 2022. You know, this is the position the Navy and DOJ documented in the public guidance on the elective option. And it's my opinion that the court will interpret that way, especially after the issue of medical monitoring for claimants without an official diagnosis has been addressed by the court. And with that, I will, uh, turn it back over to Travis to explain um, how to actually file the claim. And so for those who had joined us originally back in March, um, we had gone over a similar section uh, dedicated to the administrative claim process. Um, since then, specifically April 9th, the uh, Navy's JAG uh, uh, department has implemented and uh, essentially required that all claimants, all claims go through this JAG, uh, CLJ claim portal. Previously, um, they it was an, more of an informal uh, claims process. For individuals, it was either through uh, directly emailing a JAG office, the JAG email, um, or sending it to the JAG office for the Department of Navy. And then for attorneys, it was bulk filing to uh our uh, the email that we that we were given specifically to file uh, bulk filings. Now um, a month later, um, the whole entire game has changed uh, with a one whole one eighty, and with the introduction of this portal. And this portal, from the looks of it, it does simplify the process without having to go do the whole uh, emailing of a unknown email out in the open. Uh, it is through a uh, a portal that you can see and click through. There's FAQs, there's questions and answers that is available to everybody. And so there's two types of uh, claim filings through this portal. There's the individual claim and there's also the attor attorney bulk filing. Now with the, and this is the portal, uh, prior to this um, lead up to this webinar, I had played around with it just to make, just to get the feel of how 
this portal works, how the nuances and how easy it is to navigate. Um, and so with the individual claimants, anybody who is uh, wanting to uh, go and file their own claim on behalf of their own selves or of a uh, uh, as next of kin for a fam uh, deceased family member, um, there are certain steps. And the steps that I had to go through um, are illustrated here. The first step was to essentially create an account. The account is just a simple um, password and email, and then you will be sent a verification uh, email that uh, will be sent to you. You have to click a link just to verify that the email that you signed up for is the email you have access to. Then from there, um, you're asked to um, update your profile contact information, which goes into your name, your address, your phone number, uh, and anything that can specifically uh, recognize you as the person creating this profile. And then from there, um, you will be allowed to file, eventually file a claim. Now, um, you can see there's a screenshot of, I I've taken a screenshot of the individual claim portal. Uh, and so under, when you go under each and every single tab, uh, there's certain parts of it that need to be filled out. The first one is the readiness check, which is essentially, it asks you, do you have all the information with you to complete this uh, application all at once? Um, it'll be a yes or no question. Once you press yes, if you do have all the information, it'll lead you to the second one. Now, it, second one is the claimant information. Now, you might be thinking, well, I updated my profile information. Well, there might be some cases where you might not be the person who be claiming you will be the representative for the person who was injured and in that situation you'll put the information in of that person of a uh, uh, family member or a, if you're a power of attorney for uh, another person you'll put their information in from their social to their uh, address phone number anything that can uh, verify that they are dumb and then from there you go to the third part where it allows you if you are representing another person you can put in your information, and so you can be their point of contact. Then fourth, there's the basis of the claim, which does have a list of uh, injuries that the Navy finds, I believe, um, more common than not um, relating to the toxic water. But as Mr. Brummel uh, uh, mentioned earlier, this is, is it not an exhaustive list. Um, there's always, there is a choice for other. And if you believe that your injury falls under, doesn't fall under the categories that the Department of Navy lists, and you believe it, it should, you can always put it in the other and fill it in, and it'll ask you exactly, to specify exactly what that injury is. Then um, the claims details, it'll ask you, is this a wrongful death or is it a personal injury? And then it'll ask you how much you would uh, like to be compensated for. Um, then six, you are it asks you for any substantiating documentation, such as military records, um, uh, medical records, anything that can prove exposure and uh, uh, injury that has uh, some connection to the toxic water. And then seven, lastly, is the certification and attestation. Not only are you uh, swearing that and affirming under penalty of perjury, but you're also being swearing under Federal False Claims Act as well. And so that is the general overview of the individual claim. Now for e attorneys and bulk filing, it the process of bulk filing has changed a little bit, but is still mostly the same as well. The only difference is it now goes, instead of to an email through to the JAG office, it goes through the portal to the JAG office. And, but the same steps are exactly the same as the individual filing. You create an account and update your profile contact. And when you get to the bulk, the filing stage, there's still the same readiness check and the certification with the under a penalty of perjury and Federal False Claims Act. But the similar, the difference and what is similar is the CSV file that we previously have been uploading to an email. Now it the portal will auto-generate an uh, ID batch. And from that batch, uh, you'll uh, input it into the CSV file and the, and at in the instructions provided, 
the JAG division has provided a uh, example CSV file that you can input the information that was previously uh, put into the CSV file. Now I've been told there is certain tweaks that have been changed from the old CSV file uh, template to the new CSV file through the portal. And so you'll want to make sure uh, to pay attention to that when you're uh, filling out that CSV file. But mostly it is the same. It is uploading instead of emailing, it's just an upload. Uh, and so now you might ask yourself, I have filed, now what? Um, so there's four types of scenarios. Uh, so with under the CLJA, the Department of Navy has six months to respond. Now, if in practicality, does the Na Department of Navy actually respond? That is debatable. Um, but um, in an ideal situation, the Department of Navy does, you file the claim, they accept the claim, and they send you, send us a, and the, or the claimant, a settlement, offer a settlement, and the client accepts. At that point, the money is paid out, and the case ends there. But the other three scenarios is where the Department of Navy uh, accepts the claim, provides an uh, offer of settlement, but the client believes that is not sufficient and they can decline that offer. At that point, the claimant can file a, a federal lawsuit in North Carolina. Now, with the third scenario, the Navy did, out, does respond. They deny it and does not provide a son, offer of settlement. At that point, we can still file with a, in North Carolina. And the last and probably most common in my personal experience is the six months pass, the Department of Navy does not respond, and automatically it is deemed denied uh, by operation of the CLJA. And at that point, we'll, uh, you can file. And that's mostly where we are in large part at here at Beasley Allen of preparing our cases to be uh, filed in federal court. Now, there is another part you might be asking yourself, well, why are we using the claims portal or previously the form uh, instead of the standard form 95, the federal torts claim form? Um, specifically, the CLJA um, and the Department of Navy and the federal government have created a separate form, in this case, the portal now, um, to handle these uh, uh, Camp Lejeune claims. Uh, so as not to, I in a way, integrate these this massive class of claimants that might mess up the uh, pool of federal cl tort claims that are being filed every day as well with the federal government. And uh, so with that, I'll pass it on to Mr. Brummel, who will speak to us about the elective option, which happens after the filing of the administrative claim. Thank you, Travis. As I'm sure many of you are aware, the elective option or EO encompasses the following nine injuries. In addition to the 30 plus days of exposure needed under the CLJA, the EO adds some additional requirements such as a 35 year latency period, in addition to rigorous supporting documentation. Although we firmly believe that these are largely lowball offers for the vast majority of clients, it does provide insight into the process and represents the only cases that have so far been resolved. Um, out of the over 175,000 admin claims filed, I believe the most recent number is 110 elective option offers have been made. Um, the numbers below is just a sampling, which reflects the 51 EO offers extended by the torts branch and an additional 59 offers have been approved by the DOJ based on recommendations from the Navy. You know, as to the litigation itself, I want to pivot a little bit to the, the bellwether cases. The track one bellwether cases have been selected and injuries include bladder cancer, kidney cancer, leukemia, Parkinson's, and non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Deposi depositions for these cases are currently underway. The track two injuries likewise have been selected and include liver cancer, kidney disease, prostate cancer, and lung cancer. Um, to my knowledge, the Plaintiff's leadership is still accepting submissions um, if you want your case um, to be considered for that selection process. And finally, um, both the plaintiffs and government are to submit their proposal for track three injuries by April 26th. So now I, I want to discuss some of the more common issues we've encountered, um, starting with medical records. Yeah, given the range of 
qualifying exposure from August 1st, 1953 to December 31st, 1987. More remotely diagnosed injuries can be especially difficult to confirm. With some exceptions, most states do not require doctors or hospitals to retain medical records for more than five or 10 years. Thus, the original diagnostic document for a potentially compensable injury can be uh, problematic in many cases. So some ingenuity can come a long way in overcoming this obstacle. For example, you can ask the client if they were treated for the same injury by another provider, if they have copies of their own medical records, or if they have or can get access to an online patient portal. Alternatively, you can request insurance and pharmacy records that may document the injury. Notwithstanding, even if the original documentation is lost, it, it would be prudent to reach out to other medical providers who may have at least noted the alleged injury in the patient's past medical history. But in the absence of a perfect record, some evidence verifying the injury will likely ultimately be necessary. You know, a sworn affidavit, for example, while helpful, might not be sufficient in itself without other supporting evidence. So as, as Wes, you know, mentioned, you know, with military records, sometimes they can get lost. Um, there was a fire in 1973 in Missouri that destroyed an estimated 16 to 18 million personnel files for veterans who served from before World War II through 1963. As such, it's not entirely uncommon to receive no or limited records when ordering the official military personnel file of a veteran from the archives. Um, luckily, the government is set to produce the digitized muster rolls for those who served at Camp Lejeune. So this will be an important resource to bolster evidence of exposure, in addition to some of the other methods uh, Wes described earlier. And, and briefly, I, I want to talk about the estate issue. Um, you know, I, I believe an estate will be necessary for, for all death cases, at least at some point. However, the extent and timing of opening the estate has been addressed in a couple of recent rulings. So first, the Eastern District of North Carolina granted a partial summary judgment, finding that a plaintiff did not need to open an ancillary estate in North Carolina in order to have capacity to sue. Rather, the plaintiff's representative was appointed as personal representative in Missouri, where the decedent passed away. You know, this decision seems to clear the path for having a duly appointed personal representative um, just from the court in the state where the decedent passed away. Now, in a more recent decision from the Fourth Circuit, which oversees the Eastern District of North Carolina, the court held that a lawsuit should not have been dismissed for failing to meet the FTCA exhaustion for presentment requirements, just because the decedent's representative was not duly appointed by the court at the time the administrative claim was submitted to the Navy. Now, like I said, although an estate will likely be needed in all cases, this decision opens up the possibility that the estate could be opened later in the process. That is, that it would not necessarily be required at the time of the admin filing. So I, I think this could be especially relevant in cases where the decedent recently passed away and it would be impossible to have the estate open in, in time for the deadline. But, you know, with that being said, this issue hasn't been fully addressed in the Camp Lejeune litigation, and there are potential implications for cases where the Navy or DOJ is actively trying to settle. So even though I would strongly recommend having the estate opened, you know, before filing the administrative claim, um, this recent decision may have a little leeway um, for that. You know, and with that, I'd, I'd be happy to answer any specific questions you may have when we get to the Q&A session. So now I'll uh, turn it over to, to Ron. Yeah, so um, thanks everybody for uh, contributing. Um, you know, as you can see, uh, and I think it was mentioned, there's roughly 1,600 or a little more complaints that have been filed in the Eastern District of North Carolina. That number fluctuates, obviously. And there's uh, more than 175,000 administrative claims filed to date. Again, numbers changing probably as we speak. Um, you know, the EO, I, I think it's, it, it is a good thing for a small, small, small number of clients. Um, you know, you can kind of do the math in your head. It, it looks like about 25-ish offers have actually been accepted. 
you know, and 25 out of 175,000, you know, is, is not very many. So for that small sliver uh, of, of that unique client who's, who's in need, uh, you know, it probably is a good thing for most. It's probably not, um, you know, we're trying to work to get as many administrative claims filed as possible, as soon as possible, so that we don't bump up against August 10, just like I'm sure that um, that you guys are. And, you know, as you can see today, listening to your client, getting the details, uh, there, there are a number of issues whenever you deal with the government uh, over this span of time and you deal with medical records over this span of time that can be difficult. So, um, you know, I think all the suggestions that were made today um, are good ones. So, uh, you know, we try to uh, move through this so we can have time for a few questions. Uh, and hopefully we have done that again today. Uh, before David uh, joins back, I would add that, you know, look, we will answer each and every question that you submit. Um, we'll try to do it today. It may be into tomorrow or the next day, depending on when you ask the question or the follow-up. But um, one of, I think, the the, the primary objectives here is to make sure that you have a forum, an opportunity to uh, ask a question and, and then, you know, get the best answer we can give you. So if we can answer it today, uh, uh, probably Mary and Travis Wesley will will obviously attempt to do that. Um, but if you, you know, if you don't get an answer today, don't don't worry. We will have it uh, by email and we will get back with you and we can have as as, you know, as much of a discussion as needed to get you the, the right answer to your question. So, um, David, I'll, I'll turn it over to you. Absolutely, and Ron, uh, on behalf of all our viewers, I wanna thank you and all of the great members of your team for giving us a fantastic presentation today. We have received a number of questions during your talk, and if you'll allow me, I'm gonna present those to you and try to get your feedback. Again, as Ron said, if we don't have time to catch your question today, please submit it directly to us at webinars at beasleyallen.com. And uh, it may take us a few days to get back to you, but, but rest assured, we will get back to you. So panel, our first question comes from uh, Marita. Uh, she asks, is a positive rating from the VA linking a veteran's Parkinson's to Camp Lejeune toxins something you would use in developing your case? Yeah, I, I would say absolutely. Um, you know, we with the uh, research we have, we know Parkinson's is is linked to those certain chemicals at Camp Lejeune, but that just adds a lot of corroborating evidence um, to the claim that they acknowledge that. Okay. Our next question comes from Jennifer. She asks, "We filed an individual claim in August 2023." The JAG responded in January of this year, saying they received the claim, but with the received date of January 26, 2024. She's concerned that they're not acknowledging the original August 2023 uh, send date. Um, any thoughts on that? Um, is that cause for concern on Jennifer's part, or what do you think? I would, I'll jump in. Um, I would say no, as long as Jennifer, as long as you have the original email that you sent off to uh, both emails, the original one you sent off back on, I believe, uh, in August of last year, and the uh, answer that you, the response that you received from the JAG uh, department, um, as long as you have those two um in a very, I would say, in a very safe place, print them off as well. Uh, Want to make sure that you have backups. That is enough to, that should be enough to substantiate that you did file and that the six months has run um, from it. And so um, it, it it is very concerning that the Department of Navy does, uh, and very, very likely is either um, delaying in their response or in most cases that I've seen haven't been responding whatsoever. Um, and so, but as long as you keep doc proper documentation, uh, that is really the key to prove your, your part of the case. 
Very good. Our next question comes from Amy, who asks, do you have to provide substantiation documentation contemporaneously with filing claims on behalf of clients on the board? Yeah, I think the answer to that is, is no, generally no, but with the caveat that the Navy can ask for substantiation and you would need to produce that evidence. Um, I think in, in one of the last reports I read that the Navy has only asked for, I think, 400 something claims to be substantiated so far. So given the huge backlog, you know, I would still be prepared and it's it's always best practices to have those records on hand. But from my experience, you do not have to submit the supporting documentation contemporaneously with the admin claim. All righty, our next question comes from Tammy. Tammy asks, what if the DON did respond, but only with a perfection letter? Is that falling, falling under number four? Um, with that case, it falls, it falls within the, it's in a middle ground, I would say. It is not necessarily a rejection, um, but it's not necessarily a number four where they never responded. Uh, in that case, the Department of Navy has responded, um, and they're asking, like Marion uh, stated uh, when he was discussing perfection, um, contemporaneously, they can always, the Department of Navy can always come up later on and ask you for supporting documentation to perfect the claim of both in ex terms of exposure and as well as an injury. And so um, in that case, it still wouldn't touch in, in in my sense how I'm how I'm thinking about it. It hasn't touched one of the four, what do I do now? Um, it's still in the process between finding out and um, filing. And so um, if the Department of Navy has asked for substantiation, I would definitely follow up with that. Yeah, and I, I don't think it would count as a final disposition by the Navy. Um, so because they haven't rejected it at that point. So I, I think that the the six month of no response deadline would still be running if the Navy doesn't answer that. Very good. Our next question comes from Christine. She asks a two part question. Part one is, am I correct that if a claim has been submitted via email, it should not be resubmitted via the claims management portal. And then second, Christine asks, once a claim form is deemed denied, is there a way to submit documentation for an elective option before filing suit, or will the DOJ still be reviewing election option offers once a suit is filed? And I, and I can ask that first part again. Am I correct that if a claim has been submitted via email, it should not be resubmitted via the claims management portal. Um, I, I think that is correct. Um, the portal's only been open for, I think, a week or so. So um, if it was submitted prior to that, then I, I think I would just keep the documentation of the email. Um, as to the second question, I, I know what's been happening in the past is um, we, you request access to the safe platform from the DOJ and um, can submit uh, your elective option claims to that. I, to my knowledge, or frankly, I don't know if that's being incorporated into the new portal to submit elective option documentation. Um, but generally, we had been submitting it to the DOJ directly. I think um, Adam Inch and, and Lawrence King over at DOJ. Um, but also, you know, what we've also seen is, you know, past case that we had filed before that the the Navy or DOJ offered a uh, elective option offer on their own initiative. So I think they are saying that they are going to evaluate them on their own to see if they would qualify for the elective option, but there should still be a process for submitting claims to the DOJ, um, even if that hasn't been updated into the portal yet. Yeah, and and I I'll just add on to that um, for Christine, the you are able to go on to that portal, and register, and you should be able to 
find the claim, ideally find the claim that you previously submitted. Um, those claims that have been previously submitted were being imported into the portal. So eventually, I don't know the status of that, but eventually all those claims should be there so that you can verify that um, it's already there. Our next question comes from Barb. Barb asked, when will we be able to get access to muster rolls? Hmm. I, I believe that the government said that they would have them available by the end of March. I'm not sure if that's happened yet. Um, that was from an older um, hearing. Um, I, I know that it's forthcoming and I just, I don't know the status of if those have been made publicly available yet to plaintiffs, but it, it should be, I, I think the government agreed to provide access to all of that, um, but I'm unclear on the timing of that happening. Yeah, I don't think it's happened yet, but I think Marion is correct that it is in the works. Um, I'll look back at some of the CMOs and see if I see anything from recent filings that would indicate the actual uh, timing uh, of, of when you know it would hit. All righty, Amy and Austin have asked a similar question. What is the citation of the fourth circuit? Oh, excuse me. What is the site? What is the site for the Fourth Circuit case that you mentioned that dealt with whether an estate is required to be open to file an administrative claim? Right, and and I would refer you to. It's called the estate of Elie Yusupa Van Imberg. That's E-M-B-U-R-G-H versus the U.S. Um, and I've, I've got it pulled up here. The number they have on that is 23-1011, and that's a Fourth Circuit opinion. Um, but if you uh, if you want to email me directly, I can I can send you the link to that um, decision. And, and I'll note that this was not related to a Camp Lejeune case. Uh, it was a claim against the Navy for a wrongful death. Um, but it is from the Fourth Circuit, which would control over the, the Eastern District of North Carolina. Yeah, it's a good read. Um, and again, not on all fours, but I do think it, as we've discussed, it has some, I think, relevant information, or at least reading some tea leaves, perhaps. Okay, our next question comes from Andrew. Andrew asks, are claims being made separately for mental duress due to the exposure alone, for example, say, with, with no current illness? That's a good question. I'll take a shot, and Marion, Travis, or Wesley may add to it. I think, I, I believe that there are people that are doing that um, as to the uh, ultimate ability for that to be a compensable claim. I don't think we know that yet. Um, we're not there with the court uh, and with how the litigation is going to progress. But but again, my in, in my understanding, yes, I think people are uh, doing that, submitting that. Yeah, and I will say, um, I think the last conference, um, if you look at the transcript, they say that they want to take up the issue of of medical monitoring for people without a diagnosed injury. All right, we have time for a few more questions. Our next one comes from Heather. Uh, she asks, if a claimant has a VA, a VA rated disability injury and the VA determination links the injury to something other than Camp Lejeune, like say Agent Orange, could filing a Camp Lejeune claim for that injury cause an issue with their VA disability benefits and could the VA determination affect the Camp Lejeune claim? So, you know, we, we don't know a lot, but what we do know from the VA is that just by filing the administrative claim or lawsuit, no VA benefits will be affected. Um, and, and as to if you uh, do receive an award, um, they have said, and, and this is outside of the elective option, that any... Um, any rating or disabilities for a Camp Lejeune related injury, any treatment for that or disability award would be deducted from an overall 
any award you received out of the Camp Legion and Justice Act. Um, but I think it's it's unclear about the interaction with other potential um, causes of the disease. Um, and I think part of that will go into what the court decides on the specific versus general causation side, um, because it's not untrue that two things can contribute to the same illness. Um, so I, I think it's a little unclear about how those potential offsets may work, but we know that, you know, no, no benefits would be affected really until, you know, money's on the table and at which point, you know, the client can make a decision if they choose not to pursue it. Yeah, and I think Marion's right there. I think uh, first off under the EO, I think that's a separate issue. And they've made some rep the government's made some representations as to benefits regarding the EO that they've not necessarily made regarding anything else under the act. Um, and I guess technically, yes, it could. Um, but my belief is that it's not likely because of the things Marion just said. You know, as you go through it and as you get to a point where some form of compensation, which would have to be accepted, by the way, by your client, would be available. My belief is there would be fairly clear understanding of what accepting that relief is or isn't going to do, you know, in that regard. Okay. Next question comes from Brett. Uh, Brett says the following. He says, we didn't get a response other than the automated thank you for your submission email. So what is the deadline to file suit in North Carolina? Uh, for that one, it's, and, and I, I, I'm kind of like a broken record. Documentation is key. If you have the email that of when you sent it and the documentation of the email of when it says the automated of we have received it, um, it will be sick. I would, you can use either of those two dates. Uh, the date you sent it or the date that you received the automated uh, response. It's just six months from, and, and it's not it's not very clear on which response. Is it the day that we sent it off or is it the day we received some type of response? Uh, our position is it's the day that we file, uh, that we send it off. And so six months from then is when you will be allowed to uh, the the six, uh, six months and one day is the first day that you'll be allowed to file a, a federal lawsuit. Yeah, and, and let me just add, um, because in the vast majority of cases, the Navy has not responded within the six months, and that would be deemed a denial, um, unless they actually deny the claim, then I, I think that you would have until February of next year, in most cases, to file the lawsuit, which would be of six months after the deadline uh, for filing admin claims. So since they haven't responded in the vast majority, then um, the six months after they don't respond, then you're you're able to file the complaint. But I think you'll still have that additional time running six months or 180 days after the August deadline. Right. And the basis there, as you guys know, you know, it's the, the SRL's the is the later of August 10, 2024, or 180 days after which the claim is denied under 2675 of Title 28. Which, you know, that's basically just what Marion and Travis said. We've got time for one more question. It's from Don. Don asks, will the Department of the Navy release a second list of qualified injuries? I think that's unclear. I think that... Um, they may be in the court's hands now, the way that they're going injury by injury in each of the tracks of the Bellwether case. It's certainly possible, but I haven't seen any indication from them at this point that they are planning to um, extend the, the list of injuries. Yeah, I'm not aware either. I think Marion's right. I think the, the process through uh, the court now and the litigation from track one to track two to track three, I think that's more the focus now on uh, what will be done uh, with discovery and and causation. Um, but again, you, you know, none of us know for sure. I mean, uh, the government could could change course and put something out if they chose to or if they thought it was, uh, you know, in, in their client's best interest. Well, I, I really want to thank you, you panel members, for doing such a great job with these questions. We've still got a lot of pending questions, and I want to encourage our viewers 
Uh, if we didn't get to your question, please send it to us via email at webinars at BeasleyIsland.com. Uh, your questions will be dispersed to this team and they will do their very best to, to get you a response as soon as possible. Um, but gosh, we, we really do appreciate all of your interest. Uh, we love to answer your questions. We love to help you guys in any way that we can. Um, and for those of you who may have missed our earlier announcements, just a reminder, by the end of this week, you'll receive an email with a certificate of attendance and an updated presentation and video link. You can email your completed evaluation form to webinars at BeasleyAllen.com. Again, for those Alabama and Georgia attorneys on, on the show today, if you're participating by phone, please email us your name, phone number, and state bar ID number. Send that to webinars at BeasleyAllen.com. That'll help us ensure you receive full CLE credit. For those of you practicing in other states besides Alabama and Georgia, we're going to send you a certificate of attendance that you can present to your own state bar to try and obtain CLE credit. Also, be sure to check out the events page of our website, BeasleyAllen.com slash events, as we're going to be adding more webinars throughout the coming year. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you, as always, for supporting our Beasley Allen webinar series. Have a great rest of your day and a great rest of your week. Thanks so much.